Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here, and I've got so much to share. So I, I think we might as well just go right ahead and kick things off. So let's see here. Let me get this and going. Okay, so that actually is my basement. I, I'm, you can see that that's our green screen. That's what we use to create the course learning how to learn. We've actually got more than 3 million registered students so far in the course, which is funny because I didn't know a thing about how do you make an online course or how do you do videos or anything like that. I, I had to Google up, you know, how do you create a green screen studio? I mean, I knew nothing. So what this tells you is that it's possible, it's very possible to do good online learning, even if you're not some kind of advanced professional with lots of training in how to make you know, online courses, because, well, it, it, if I did it, you can really do it too. So I am from Oakland University, and people often think that's part of California because it's Oakland, Oakland, California, but no, actually I am from Michigan. And so, um, oh, I've got a little funny going on. Okay, and so anyway, that's me going to work at my day job in Michigan. And my co-instructor in the course is Terry Sanowski, and that's him going to his day job in uh, San Diego, so near La Jolla. So uh, that's one of the nice things about online learning is it can help not only students get together from very different backgrounds, but even the instructors can have very different backgrounds as well. So I was, I was shocked. I was invited to speak at Harvard. I was a nervous wreck because it's Harvard and you know, and then I got there and it was even more nerve wracking because it was packed, standing room only. And, and I thought, why are there so many people here? Well, come to find out that, that the number of people in our massive, one massive open online course made for practically nothing, mostly in my basement, that the number of people we had in that course was the same on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's massive open online courses and online courses put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. So again, this tells you that you don't need to have some fancy team. You can actually do some pretty good stuff yourself. And if you know a little bit about learning, you can actually do something that's uh, really engaging for students. So, in fact, the online world is pretty competitive. Uh, it's a mixture of what I, I like to think of as academia, the Silicon Valley, and all with a little bit of Hollywood. And the reality is people just love it. And I'll give you just one uh, example of that is, this is our daughter, our older daughter, Rosie. And so, when the massive open online course, uh, Learning How to Learn, was when I was putting it, it together, uh, one little tip for you, a pro tip, is use your family members because they'll work really cheap. They'll work for food. So our, our older daughter modeled for us uh, the idea of using earphones to block out sounds when you're really trying to focus and pay attention. And it so happens she had this big honking set of earphones on her lap and she was willing to look a little bit dorky for the camera. And, but the thing is, she was at that time a third year medical school student. And her, uh, one of her professors was a prestigious cardiologist from Southeast Michigan. He was teaching the class, I had some 70 students or so in it. He suddenly stops the class, points right at her and says, you, you are the one in the massive open online course. Here's this fellow who's an advanced professional, no need to be watching anything. And he's actually getting something from that course that he couldn't get elsewhere. And that's, that's what online learning can do. It can, 
It can reach people. It can teach information in a way that is very truly satisfying for individuals. And I will show you why it can be so profoundly satisfying through the course of this talk. We'll talk about what's happening in people's brains when they're watching videos and engaging with a lecture. Uh, but um, it's, uh, there, there's one other sort of aspect of online learning, I think that is also easy to forget. And this relates to my favorite athlete of all time, Julius Yego. Julius uh, comes from Kenya. And Kenya, if you know anything about sports, they're very well known for their long distance runner. Well, if you look at Julius's arms, you can tell he's probably not a long distance runner. And indeed, he always grew up wanting to throw the javelin. The problem was there were no javelin throwing coaches in Kenya. He couldn't afford to go flying overseas and get some kind of terrific coaching. So he actually, what he did was he started watching YouTube videos and then going out and practicing, watching, practicing, watching, practicing. And do you know that 99.9% .9 just by watching these videos and actively practicing, he became the world champion in the javelin. So you might think, oh, well, you, it's impossible to teach X on, uh, via online. Pretty much whatever it is, there is a way to teach it and to teach it really well. And there's major advantages. So what is, online learning. First, we should probably talk about what good online learning is not. So what I want you to do is I want you to watch the following video and I want you to make some notes. And after this video plays, what, what, what I want you to do with these notes is just sort of jot down a few words to remind you of what are the worst aspects of this video. What, what is this instructor doing wrong? And uh, make some notes and then we're going to go into breakout sessions for just just about two, three minutes. And we're, at that time I want you to discuss with your fellow breakout session people what was wrong with that video. And so let's go ahead and play the video and then I'll move you into breakout sessions. So let's see, here we go. And we're starting. My lecture today will give you an introduction to photosynthesis. Uh, look at the panel on the right, uh, I mean your left. You see that photosynthesis changes sunlight into chemical energy splits water to liberate O2 and fixes CO2 into sugar. In plants and algae, photosynthesis takes place in the organelles called chloroplasts. You see a chloroplast on the right. Hmm. Uh, let's go deeper and look at the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis at the thylakoid membrane. Um, the flow of electrons down the electron transport chain leads to the ultimate reduction of NADP to NADPH. Uh, in conclusion, you can note all of the following ideas. This should give you a good overview of this vitally important process. So there we go. There is a bad video and actually I will not tell you what course this is taken from but it's pretty much an emulation of some of the materials that you will see online. My and lecture oops, today. There we go. So uh, so with that let's see I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go to breakout rooms. So let's see what we got here. Um, okay breakout rooms. So we're going to do breakout rooms for three minutes, so you you should get a two minute warning. So does that make sense, Chris? Um, hopefully, there we go. Okay, I'll see you in the breakout rooms. That's perfect. Okay. Thanks so much, Doctor. Are we good? I think we're good. Okay, so I think we've got pretty much everybody back. 
So I will, let's see, why don't I go back? Did you, uh, so I observed in some of the different rooms, um, people were making some terrific observations. I, I should say right off the bat that that actually was not any kind of recorded lecture that a professor did. That was my husband emulating professors. So, uh, so there's, uh, there was no one being made look really guilty, uh, in particular, except maybe my husband, and he doesn't like. So, but you noticed, uh, and I heard some of the observations that he, that, for example, he, there were too many uh, visuals. It was all very complex. Everything was presented at once. Um, he himself would sometimes block, like at the very end, he blocked the points he's trying to conclude with. And I'm not making that up. That's actually out there in some real um, courses that you'll see. He, it, it's kind of a little hard to tell, but actually if you watch the entire video, you'll see that he sways sometimes like this. And there are other people in some of the other videos that sway even more, so you can get seasick just watching. And it, it, it can be almost habitual that when you're a little bit nervous, you can kind of go like this and sway a little bit, rock a little back and forth. You really want to not do that in front of the camera. So um, he wore a plaid shirt, which can be quite busy for a, uh, some, something like that. He mumbled. He was not enthusiastic. He looked like he was super boring. Part of the thing is when you are teaching online, you, it, it's almost like the camera subtracts charisma points. So you need to be bigger than life when you're speaking to the camera, just because it's, it, it subtracts these points um, automatically. Uh, there's a, I don't know if any of you watched the television show by Guy Fieri, where he goes to rural restaurants around the country and will show, showcase some of their food. When he first goes to interview these restaurants, he'll show up like two weeks before and he'll just kind of look around and he's really a normal person. But then when he shows up for filming, he is completely different. He's on fire. He is Guy Fieri. He's bigger than life. And that's because during filming, you need to be a little bigger than life. Uh, it's what attracts people's attention. Another thing is just people have enough bad stuff going on in their life. They need to feel like there's someone who's who's upbeat and, and, and it really helps them. So we're going to talk about some of the theory of online learning a little bit later. And we'll cover it quickly, so don't worry. Uh, but in this in these theories, you will see how almost every one of the principles that are discussed were violated back in that original video. Now I do want to just, I'm just gonna very quickly go through, just I won't go individually through things, but there is synchronous teaching, which is more or less what I'm doing right now. I'm speaking live to you. And I'm trying to make these definitions very clear because for example, I was just talking with someone this morning from a massive um, school district in a very large uh, state, and they thought that uh, that synchronous teaching um, was actually the opposite of what it actually is. But what it really is is just me speaking live to you, and there's advantages for it. Um, I mean, I can be bigger than life and I can try to communicate some of these ideas. I can answer questions. Uh, there's, you feel like you're connected with a social community, uh, but there's um, disadvantages as well. It's, you know, it, you've got to have the bandwidth. If everybody in your family, for example, is online at the same time for work, for school, for so forth, it's not going to work very well. So it, it can also be harder to co prepare compelling sorts of presentations. It actually can be easier when you're doing asynchronous teaching. 
And asynchronous, of course, is when you're creating materials that can be accessed at any time, such as videos or uh, documents and so forth. Because you have more time to prepare this kind of thing, you can actually make better asynchronous materials sometimes than you can synchronous. Um, but at the same time, um, it, it's, it can take more time to create the materials, even though you can reuse them and so they, they can make up for that time. You're not ha having as an immediate a communication with students. So these are the two major different types of um, online teaching. A lot of uh, teachers moved immediately to synchronous teaching on Zoom when we went when the whole COVID um, catastrophe, catastrophe first began to unfold. But uh, but the, there are challenges with that trying to put everything synchronous. So. I really want to also be bringing up in this presentation a lot of the ideas and the advantages of good asynchronous uh, teaching. One, uh, I read a paper recently, and this fellow was comparing online or uh, teaching face to face with teaching online. And the paper concluded that teaching face to face was far better. But here was a problem. His face-to-face, -face, he was in front of the class and teaching in a very good way. His online teaching, he basically just stuck a bunch of documents online and called that online teaching. That's not good online teaching. It's the equivalent of saying, well, let's see, let's put our instructor in a box at the front of the classroom and see how well she or he does. Well, you can't teach very well from a box. And similarly, there are, you know, there's ways to really expand and make good online learning. And that's, of course, what we're going to be talking about. The first rule of online learning, then, is don't throw a bunch of documents online. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard for people to read papers and understand things. That's why we have teachers so that we can give nice, pithy explanations about the key ideas that we're trying to communicate. And, uh, and just throwing a bunch of documents online is really bad. Uh, it's bad online learning. Uh, if, if you look inside the brain, I think we need to take a step back. And I talked a little this morning about uh, how the brain learns. But we should, in particular, try to better understand what's going on in working memory when you're learning something. And so uh, I'll just do a very quick review for those of you who missed the uh, morning's presentation. The brain is filled with neurons, and neurons send signals to one another. So here we go. There's a, uh, an electrical signal traveling from one neuron. Dr. To Oakley, neuron. I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, could, could, would, you mind sh would you mind sharing your screen uh, so oh, that everyone can see the slides? Goodness. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Apologies, all. Well, thank you, Chris. Okay. So you can get so into what you're talking about that you miss some of the basics. So let's see here. We'll get, uh, where's my, oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we're here and we'll, okay. This is perfect. Okay. So here we go. We're in the brain and we're now looking at uh, neurons and how neurons um, send signals electrically. So here we go, we've got a little electric. So this is like the 30 second recapitulation of what I covered this morning. Um, basically, when you learn something, you're creating sets of links between neurons. And that's whatever you're learning, whether it's math, a language, a science, uh, principles of history or whatever. So you're just creating links. And of course, the more you practice with those sets of links, especially with retrieval practice, the better you can be. 
so you learn it more deeply and you create those sets of links and then the sets of links get stronger and richer and deeper as you practice more. So this brings me to, uh, I think, something that's actually critically important for, um, for when you're learning anything, uh, at least learning declaratively, and that relates to your working memory. So working memory is what you can hold temporarily in mind. Long-term memory is, of course, what you've got uh, that, like, you can remember what your mother's face looked like, uh, the maybe the address you live at, your phone number, maybe. Um, so long-term memory, you, you've got those links stored there, and you can access them whenever you need it. But working memory, I like to think of it, uh, you know, here's a, a, a young student. Uh, you can see what's happening is that working memory is almost like an octopus that's in your prefrontal cortex and it can hold four things in it. So four pieces of information on average. So, well, some people will have smaller working memory, some people have larger. When I haven't had my coffee yet, I can like maybe hold one piece of information. But anyway, your working memory uh, is, is in the, the front of your brain. The lo your long-term memory, however, is scattered all around your neocortex. But for our purposes, we can kind of think of it as it's like a locker that's scattered around. And inside this locker, you've got these sets of links that you create by virtue of the fact that you learn this information. So uh, working memory, when you're, you know, when you're working and learning something, it is actually working to put together sets of links. And those sets of links are being stored in long-term memory. And later, what, if they're well stored there, your working memory can reach out and grab those sets of links. So this brings me to our other daughter, uh, our younger daughter, Rachel. And Rachel is, she's gonna model for us what it felt like for her when she was first learning to back up a car. And so, I mean, when you're learning to back up a car, it's really hard. It, it's, you, well, watch, watch Rachel as she's, she's modeling for us what it was like. I mean, look at her little face. It's like, what do I look in this mirror? Do I look in that mirror? Wh which mirror do I look at? What, wait, no, and then off she goes into the ditch. The, the thing is, when you are first learning how to do something, your working memory is working really hard to try to figure out what's going on. And it has what is called a heavy cognitive load. There's no working memory available for anything else. But once you have learned how to back up a car, then it all is kind of easy. All you have to do is just think, well, I want to back up a car. That thought is drawn up into mind and you can back up the car. You have a very light cognitive load because it's being performed, the actual activity is more in long-term memory. So your working memory isn't having to hold much or do much. It's even, it's got arms available for other things like, um, like what's playing on the radio? Is my seatbelt fastened? All this kind of thing. So it's, um, so once you've learned something and parked it in long-term memory, it makes it very much easier. It offloads a lot of that information. And one of the things that people, that researchers were astonished by is that when experts, when somebody's first learning something, what they find is that their working memory is working really, really hard. But once they gain expertise at a topic, 
their walking memory doesn't work very hard at all. It's super easy for them. And it's like there's a little activity elsewhere in the brain. That's because working memory doesn't have to work so hard anymore. It's just drawing on that information in long-term memory. So you're probably thinking, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, what the heck does this have to do with online learning? And I think part of it is um, when you're learning something and you know it well, it's kind of easy for your, your little working memory to sit down to a test and pull out some sets of links on, on related topics and put them together to solve that test question. But notice, you know, when you're learning something, the working, your working memory is the bottleneck. That's the problem. Once you get it in, once you get those sets of links into working memory and then in through to long-term memory, you can become an expert. Got lots of sets of links to draw on. But it's getting that information in to working memory in the first place that's important. So what, so what I wanna do is before I explain why it's important, let's go into a, a breakout session and we'll take about three minutes here and I want you to just, why on earth am I talking about working memory? Um, why could it possibly be important in online learning? So uh, take, take about three minutes with your um, uh, breakout sessions. I will put, them in, put you in it now, and we will see you in three minutes. Sorry, folks, I'm, I'm trying to assign you uh, manually if you haven't been assigned before. It's so totally, It's totally fine. Okay. I actually have a weird question. Okay. The working memories in an ideal situation looks like they can connect in the chain. But as we sometimes repeat ourselves, we thought sometimes it takes repetitive efforts. What if some students, they took it the wrong way, they keep repeating the wrong information and that potentially will cause the wrong, the wrong working memory to be formed, which in which as a result in the future, it's actually harder to recorrect that working memory into the correct version. Uh, is that something you potentially would talk about in your presentation or am I just thinking too much? No, you're not thinking too much at all. In fact, I, I wish I had added a little animation here. So I guess we're gonna have a separate, this is our larger breakout room right here. <laughs> uh, um, but um, the thing is, so when you are learning something, you're actually, uh, you're making a, uh, like that, that little signal that travels along, it first learns because you get a signal, or, you know, right before that, that neuron actually fires for whatever reason. Then that neuron will kind of go, oh, that signal, that must have been an important signal because it may it, it's it had to do with me firing. So it's called long-term potentiation. It builds that set of, of uh, or that connection there. Getting rid of a problematic connection is hard. You have to like teach it to stop firing. And the best way to do that is to just not be reactivating this there, there's some evidence that if you learn something wrong, it can kind of stick with you pretty darn well. Right. And it, it takes a lot of unlearning. In fact, it's easier to teach people, for example, in psychology, they found it's much easier to teach students who've had no exposure previously to psychology um, about latest techniques of psych or insights from psychology because you're not having to unlearn anything. So unlearning is, is hard. It just takes a lot of practice and a lot of focusing on the right thing and not focusing on the wrong thing. Um, so very good question. Thank oh, you. and I probably better have this end. So 
that we so we have one more minute here if anybody else has a quick question <laughs> i just want to let you know what you said is exactly what my racquetball coach told me i had to unlearn how to hit badminton and tennis before i can learn how to play racquetball yeah uh, and that's that's so true and like Tiger Woods, when he uh, he was really a risk taker too, because he would sometimes unlearn a swing so that he and while he was learning a new swing, and you're just really kind of awful at both of them for a little while, uh, but he would take that risk to try to come up with ways to improve his golf swing. So, um, you know, I I. I, I, my, I salute people who are, are able to go through that dip of switching over to a, a new learning. Um, okay, so hopefully, let's see, let's see. I, this time I am not going to forget. Um, does any brave soul want to... Um, actually venture an idea about why working memory is important? Yeah, maybe I'll, uh, th this is what in our group we discussed about it. It's, it's very important to absorb the information, knowledge base, with the short term in the class in the an hour or two hour session. It's like a working storage device in the front line. So that's how we thought it's very important to give the necessary tools to absorb that as much as possible for the student or learner to absorb into the working memory so that in turn this will get back in the long-term memory. That's what we were discussing. You are right at the heart of why, that, why working memory is so important. And I'm going to give you a little visual that will help you see it even better. Uh, and so I just have to get my share screen back up. Okay, so here we go. And here is my visual. Okay, so there we go. Oh, back here. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, so there, you can see there, what, what I'm trying to show is that when you are grabbing information and you're trying to create the sets of links, the, the, the thing is you have some aspects of your working memory relate to what you're hearing. Other parts of working memory relate to what you see. So if you can hear and see at the same time, it's like you're using your working memory, memory more efficiently. And so it helps to be able to grab that information and, and learn it more easily. This is why, um, for example, they'll say, um, when you're stuck trying to figure out a plumbing problem or something, your first tendency is let's go look online and see if there's a YouTube video because you can learn it so much more quickly than if you had to sit there and read manuals about how to learn well so, or how to do that particular procedure or whatever. So uh, both visual and uh, audio learning at the same time is called multimedia learning, which is like a big name for the fact that, oh, you hear it and you see it at the same time, but it's really helpful. So uh, the first rule, according to my playbook, of making engaging online courses is to make engaging videos. It, uh, it surprises me. Sometimes I will look at um, courses on how to make online you know, courses, and they'll talk about virtually everything except making videos. But the first thing people go to, because it makes learning so easy, is videos. And you don't have to be some kind of superstar. Like I'll talk about how to make some highfalutin or relatively highfalutin videos, but you can just use um, Microsoft's export function and you can create MP4s. You want me to see if I can, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure that this is going to do this. Okay, can I'm hoping. To, can you see what I'm I'm doing here? I think you can. If you go, uh, we to, can see. Yes. Okay. If you go to this export function, and then go, so you know it's just you're in Microsoft. You go to File, go to Export, then look at this. Create a video. Oh, also, I I've got to point out this. Create an animated GIF. If you have ever thought about, oh, I'd like to make a little GIF of blah. If you could just make it on your uh, uh, PowerPoint, do what you want to do then this create an animated GIF thing will just create a nice little, look at that, a second spent. I just usually have one slide and I make it be like three seconds or something like that. And it, it will paste through all the animations within that slide and it's really cool. But you can also do create a video. And what you wanna set it on is, you know, you can, Usually, you don't want to have it on super high quality because it goes too slow for a lot of people. So maybe like the 720 is a pretty good choice, but even 420 is good too. Um, use, see how you can set this on don't use recorded timings and narratives. And uh, or, so what you want to do is actually choose this record timing and narrations. So you choose this and it will, uh, so that will automatically just get rid of this. Um, I don't want to do it right now because it'll kind of get scrapped, but then you can create a video and it'll start filming you. So uh, it'll film you and have you in a corner, but you can expand that uh, or cut it out of a, a particular slide if you want to cut it out and not have and just have I, I noticed that when we're talking about the bad uh, professor and the bad teaching some people were saying sometimes you shouldn't even be on screen at all well if you use this export video you can just cut out and um, just play with it within a half an hour you will see it's so intuitive the only thing is when you are recording slides, as you finish one slide and you begin narrating the next, there's about a three minute or three second hiatus where it doesn't catch your voice. So you have to kind of stop yourself and not, um, you know, not, not uh, um, speak during that time, which can be a little hard. But I just want to give you a quick background on, uh, you know, how did online courseware uh, develop, and, and because that will also give you a sense of what works and what doesn't. MIT Open Courseware pioneered the idea of let's videotape everybody or all our instructors or many of them and and put it online. And if you look, you can see the good and the bad of this. This fellow is sitting there with his back to the camera and he's writing and it's really, it's slow. He's not really talking directly to you. And, you know, so that was a problem. So then people thought, well, we can have the person actually face the camera. And this is an example of facing the camera and just having bullet comes up, bullet points come up so you, you're on green screen, and I'll, I'll tell you what green screen means in a little bit, or I'll show you. I call this death by bullets. It can be really um, boring to have just blah, 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 the person's talking, and the bullets come up. Sometimes I have pictures, but you can see what's going on here. It's the same problem we have now with synchronous, which is that you're, uh, I'm in a box in the corner. Hello, can I, hopefully you can see me. But uh, I, so you're having to process the box in the corner and also the imagery. And it's two different things and that makes a heavier cognitive load. So, um, you know, uh, so there's always something I call bookcase in the background syndrome. So there's me in my regular office. We're visiting friends now in Washington State. And so I have a very nice empty room here. Um, but if I had a nickel for every professor that came up to me and said, 
you know, I'm not sure what kind of background I should have. I wanted to be kind of intellectual, a little different, show that I'm creative. And they always have bookcases in the background. So I, uh, you know, just think about what your backgrounds are and, uh, and just realize that depending on what you're trying to teach, it may be too cluttered for, for um, you know, for them to really see you and pick out what's actually going on. Um, there's, there's been so many papers over the years that have uh, concluded that six minutes is about the right length for a video, but that's actually not true. Um, more recent research has found that people, they'll get up after six minutes and walk away, but they'll come back. In fact, I was recently speaking with a producer from Crash Course, which is a very popular um, YouTube um, show uh, or set of shows. And they were saying they're looking for 20 to 25 minute content because people really like longer content. Um, the, the thing to be aware of is often, I, I think it is valuable to have six minute or so videos. But that doesn't mean film 60 minutes of footage and then cut it up every six minutes. So you've got, uh, uh, you, you've got to kind of plan your videos. A video should have a beginning and an end. And if you're just videotaping an entire lecture and snipping it and throwing it online, that's not really, um, that's not what they mean when they, when they say, create a short video. So, and indeed, in some topics, for example, when you're teaching engineering and you're doing a complicated derivation, I'm sorry, you can't do it in six minutes. But that's okay, you can do something longer, but do try to break it up if it goes too long and have something that is engaging the students. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, things like microphones. Um, let's see, I wonder if I, should I be daring? Maybe I should be daring. We'll walk on the wild side here. And uh, let's see if I can get my, okay, so what I'm gonna do, right now I'm on this microphone. Let's try my Logitech Brio, which is my camera. And let's just switch to that. So can you see, can you detect, is there a difference in how I sound? I'm just kind of prattling here so that maybe you can detect it. Uh, maybe get some, if you can in the chat room, just kind of say whether you can tell if there's a difference or not. And this kind of thing with some of the sound because they say that sound is actually 51% of a presentation. And that's because if you can't hear it, you know, or it's really staticky or whatever, it just makes it hard to understand. And there truly is something called Zoom fatigue. And that's, that's why I, I tried to spend so much time, even though it's not visible, but it's like, trying to find the perfect place here where I've got adequate lighting, not too busy in the background. I've got good sound for you. Uh, all of these can help prevent that, that subtle cognitive fatigue that can occur when you're trying to watch someone who's kind of, their lips are a little out of sync with what you're hearing. And uh, of course they're static and there's blips in and out and all that kind of stuff. So, um, Let's see, I want to make sure I, let's see, did I, yep, I'm back on my, okay, so uh, be careful of uh, microphones. Uh, I, I like the Blue Yeti, I think that's a really good one. Uh, you can set it up, one thing to be aware of, you can go to Amazon, you'll see these little video reviews of devices, watch those. They're usually like two to five minutes and they will tell you like really easily how to change the settings on your microphone or how to use it. And it, it can make everything go much quicker. And why? It's because it's multimedia learning. Um, so um, 
Yeah, uh, so I, uh, this microphone in particular is nice because you can set it so that you can either have it directional just on you or directional all around. I inadvertently once had a microphone set so that it picked up all, all around me and I gave this brilliant, I gave this brilliant discussion um, of, you know, it was a, a engineering derivation and I was so pleased with myself. And then I, uh, and I, I was like, that's the best talk I've ever given. They're just going to love this. And I played it back. You could hear my husband snoring in the background. So uh, do not set it on surround pickup unless you really want it to be picking up all the surround sound. Uh, uh, a headset microphone can work very well. Um, just play around with different microphones uh, and listen to people with different microphones and ask them what they've got. Um, it, can, it, it can make it much easier for your students. Um, the brain, as, we, as you've probably gathered, is also very, very visual. You can see here the main visual centers, but actually almost half the brain is connected in visually. So what this means is um, it's important to have, um, you know, to be aware of the visual part of what you're teaching. So for me, I have a, well, should I show you? I hope I can do this without messing things up. But it, I, it's just, I'm sitting here and it's, uh, it's just a window. So it's natural light. You can see there's horses over in the corner and there's beautiful fields and so forth. So it's, I'm just using natural light because that's what I've got available for me, but it, it can work really pretty well. So if you can have um, a key light that's either right directly in front of you or it, it's pretty, my light is pretty directly okay. Uh, in a pinch, for example, when I'm traveling, this can work pretty well. So just having a, a good light source in front of you, never behind you, because that will just be backlighting terribly. Um, but a little bit of backlight, if you have a fancy setup, if you're sitting in front of your computer screen um, and you want to be a little fancy, have a stronger light coming at you from one side, a little bit of subtle light on the other side to take away the shadow, and then maybe a bit, little bit of backlight to give you some you know, that little halo perspective, uh, that, that can work really well. If you do green screen, and we're going to talk about green screen, um, it, you, you would have a screen behind you where this wall is right here, for example, and you'd set up everything pretty much the same except you add in one more light. So usually four lights are better for green screen. And green screen, so basically, you're often filming uh, at a bit of a uh, faster rate, so like 80. Um, and so, so when you're moving your hands, you don't see a bunch of green. So if you're if you're moving, if your camera is set so it, uh, you know, is acquiring those, um, uh, you, you know, all the images at a more rapid setting, it will work better, but you have to have a, a little bit more light for that kind of situation. So uh, now oh, all of these slides, uh, Course Hero should have them. So if you want them, um, you know, they're, they're yours. Oh, if you're creating online materials, it, uh, like a video, um, one thing I, I try to get people to avoid is don't use any of those really expensive um, sites like Getty Images. You can spend 500 bucks a pop just to get somebody playing, kicking a soccer ball around. It's, it's crazy. And you can do that kind of thing yourself with your friends uh, or, you know, like our son-in-laws from Chile. So I'm like, shoot some soccer footage literally footage because it's feet uh, kicking a soccer ball and that that saved quite a bit of money but when you're getting imagery for videos try to get uh think about moving imagery so let's see if this should be moving uh there we go so um uh, uh, 
you can get like all of these, you've got an engine here, you've got the heart, you've got the spread of the Mongolian Empire, you've got a hippocampus. All of these are available for free in, on Wikipedia. So for Wikipedia, uh, if you look in Wikimedia, you can usually find some really nice imagery. Just double check if it says fair use, do not use it because fair use just means they can get away with using it on Wikipedia because it's uh, not for profit. But you may or may not, depending on how you're using the materials, uh, be able to um, use something for fair use. But if it's just public domain or has been transferred so that the, the rights are publicly available, then they, they have lots and lots of imagery that's available that way. So I personally love Wikipedia and Wikimedia. Um, it, it's got lots of good stuff. So, um, and as I mentioned, take this is the soccer footage that my son-in-law made for me, which saved me 500 bucks. Yeah, uh, it's so take get pictures. Um, uh, and like this is me going to sleep. I'm talking about sleep <clears throat> and learning. And so uh, you can see it works out pretty well. This is me just riding a bus. Um, and <clears throat> and you can see uh, that's just just sort of things that we captured just on the off chance that maybe it'd be good for learning or for the online materials. And what you'll see is students love to see you. They love to see sort of little images of you or just how, how you're inserting yourself in. And this is what makes your course something that students really want as opposed to some kind of really uh, wonderfully produced um, professional course that's cold as ice. There is a major university system, which I will not mention what state that was in, but they spent $2 million to make eight MOOC videos. And they had something like 300 students take that MOOC over a couple of years and they eventually had to throw, show it, or shut it down. And part of the problem was, I think they just used professional producers to create these instead of the heart of the instructor. And that is actually what can really make the courses. So, uh, so you, you have much, um, you can make a tremendous difference and you can do things far better than just a regular production company can ever do because you are the heart of your teaching. So here's just a little bit more. Uh, I don't have my Wacom tablet with me, but it's, it's sort of a, I mean, I can actually use this iPad and just plug it in, uh, but a Wacom tablet is about this size and you can plug it in with a USB and then I can sit and I can write with my stylus and I can write on PowerPoints and so forth. You can also do it if you have a touch screen, that's, that makes it super easy. Um, so these are all ways you can write on your, your um, material. Um, also, one thing, in case it ever causes a problem, sometimes when you're writing, your hand can go onto the device and kind of foul up your writing. So there's these cheap anti-fouling gloves that you can get uh, that even if you touch the screen, it's not going to mess up your, your writing. So you can fill out notes by hand. Uh, this is just a really good way is to give students partially filled out notes and then you write by hand what those key points that you really want them to get. For example, a set is a collection of objects called, and I really want them to get the word elements and to think about that word. And so I write that word in. And here's, here's me just filling out part of a partially completed um, PowerPoint. And I load the PowerPoint online, and then they're able to download it or have it on their computers.
And there you go. You can see that I, I'm just filling this out and that's, you kind of get the central idea here. And we're about to, um, well, I think at this point though, I should take like a five minute break just so you can have a little bit of a biology check if you need it. And so uh, I will be here during this five minutes. So if you have questions, I'm gonna take it off of screen share. And, um, and uh, so feel free to ask me questions. I'll be lingering here and we will resume at exactly 2.10, well, 2.10 Pacific time. Thanks so much, Dr. Oakley. This is obviously uh, fantastic. Uh, we have some great questions from the chat. Uh, I think just to summarize a couple of them, uh, thanks, we, we actually have some of those in the chat also answering the questions too. Annabelle, you're really doing well there, I appreciate it. Uh, ac accessibility issues seem to be coming up uh, a couple of times. Uh, students with low bandwidth for videos, uh, maybe faculty members who are hesitant to drop money on, on a microphone. Uh, any general advice uh, on the subject of uh, accessibility when it comes to uh, creating videos and sharing them with students? Okay, so, so the first thing is um, work with what you have to begin with. Uh, so, you know, like whatever microphone you have, if it's the laptop mic, use it. There are, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but there are screencasting programs. You can usually get a free version of the screencasting program and you can at least do simple stuff that way. Um, the, the problem is there is no perfect answer online. So you, you creating videos and putting them up, the, the lower, you know, the, um, the pixel density, the easier it is going to be for students to download these materials. But it, it's, it's actually, it is really helpful for students to be able to access uh, videos and so forth at any time. So the, about the best thing you could do to, I think, enhance what your, um, you know, your regular day-to-day -day teaching is to have some of these material, these extra materials available. And it, you can, like I said, you can do them with PowerPoint, you can create these videos, you can talk through what you're doing, and you can do it really cheaply. Now, uh, the issue arises of, I personally am a huge fan of having captions. And the, the, of course, you can go to YouTube and YouTube will make captions, but they're not really very good and they're not certainly not adequate for someone who might be hearing uh, impaired. The best low cost uh, captioning um, company I've found so far is rev.com. So it's rev.com. And this, see, the thing is, People often think of captioning as, you know, it's only for the hearing impaired, but it actually helps everyone if you are able to do captioning. But for example, right now, when we're going live, uh, captioning is just not an option, at least at present, although there are some really wonderful captioning and translating um, uh, apps that are, you know, in, in the offing or even already in existence. So it's um, uh, whichever, whatever you're doing online, you're not going to be able to meet everyone's needs if you're only teaching synchronously. You're not going to meet everyone's need if you're only teaching asynchronously. But you're, if you are able to put materials on in both ways, um, it can you can reach the widest possible set of. Um, you know, of, of folks. One thing I, I should point out, there are online high schools that have been teaching for a decade or more. And you might think, well, online is really a bad place for um, problem students. But what they find is 
problem students actually often surprisingly excel in the online environment? Because if you think about it, I mean, you can't get into a physical fight very easily with, you know, when you're online, it's easy to mute a, pro you know, a, a, a student that might be creating a bit of a disruption. And uh, so they, they find, and a lot of students find they can focus better. If I was in a regular classroom, a typical classroom, they did a study once and it has, they have on the order of 18 door opens and door closes in a typical classroom for an hour. And so, you know, that's a distraction. You're constantly getting these distractions and you cannot push a professor, you know, you can't like push a button and say, halt, replay yourself. You can only do that a tiny bit, but online you can replay things as much as you want. So um, hopefully I, I've tried to kind of, uh, I think that there is absolutely no perfect learning system, but on, the online world provides a uh, fantastic new doorway that can that can help students who have often not really had a, um, an accessible way of um, you know of reaching education before. Okay, oh, we've got some rules here. Oh, this is great. Probably should have done this. Oh, Kaltura also provides lecture captions. Yeah. Um, this is, this is, will the presentation be available later? I guess it will. Oh, Annabelle, thank you for rep.com. So uh, what was the programming for captioning? Oh, yeah, rep.com. Okay, oh, oh, we're here at 2.10 my time. So let's go back to our presentation. Okay, so here we go. Where is my key? There. Okay, there we go. So we've already, so show students what to look at. Um, so it, it's easy to be talking, but not showing students what you're talking about. So this one, this video kind of goes a little bit crazy that way, uh, but you'll, you'll get the idea that, you know, try to show students and they can always pause it if you're overwhelming them with too much at once. Um, so here we go. So you get a sense of, see, in when you're using some of these um, uh, video production, like this is produced with Camtasia. Camtasia has a free version that used to be called Jing, and now it's like uh, TechSmith Plus or something like that. But um, the, here's the thing. There are lots of screencasting softwares out there. Uh, like Screencastify and I don't know, just look them up and you'll see free, all sorts of screencasting softwares and they will capture whatever you've got on the screen. But what they will do is they will suck you in and you'll get used to the very simple um, screencasting that they are, you're able to do. But then as soon as you want to do something a little fancier, you got to pay more money. And so, uh, so you can start with those and you can make videos, you know, to start with really well. If you're thinking that you're ever going to, you know, like maybe do a little bit more, I highly recommend Camtasia. I do not get paid by Camtasia. I just like their stuff. They have, you can watch one or, or their first two five minute videos that are their tutorials and you're on your way. So spend, now remember, 
when you learn and you sleep at night, it's really important because it helps you. So if you do a half an hour one day, sleep one night, half an hour next day, sleep again. By the third day, you are already an expert with Camtasia. Now, I say this with, for example, a lot of uh, professional video editing is done using um, Adobe's products. So um, Premiere Pro is a big, uh, it can take you, and I am not kidding, it can take you six months to really feel comfortable like you're an expert with Adobe Premiere Pro. So sure, you can do a lot of stuff with it. It's green screen is a little bit better than Camtasia's, uh, a lot better, but it, it just takes you so long to look at it. So these are all of the different pluses. If, you know, if you have no money, use some of the free software, uh, you know, like Screencastify with this, the free versions. If your school will do a little bit, get them to buy Camtasia for you and a Wacom tablet, unless you have a, um, a touch screen and you'll just be really happy. Uh, um, whatever you do, when you're making videos, even if you're making videos with uh, PowerPoint's export function, just make sure you keep all of your files very well organized. So this, this is actually what um, what a typical class looks like for me on uh, in Moodle, and you can see what I did is I have a video, I've got the PowerPoint that goes with that video, and then I've got like homework assignment and then a quiz. The, if you see how I've got kind of things recessed there, so it's not all of this great big chunk of stuff, but but students can kind of realize, ah, that's this set of materials, this set of materials. If you can, if you can organize things well like this online, oh, it makes everything really nice for your students. Um, I, let's see, I have some really awful humor. Um, so let's see, maybe I'll just kind of cut over here and see if I can, oh, yeah, that's, Oh, okay, so this is me in China making a teapot for tea tests, ha ha ha, in, so we've got this, and let's see, yeah, okay. So, so interject a little bit of humor in what you're doing. If there is one magic ingredient for online learning, it is to have occasional little bits of, of humor. And you don't need to be funny all the time. Just every five or seven minutes, just get something just a little wacky. Uh, Speaking I mean, of something a little wacky, I, this is an interruption, another way to, to, to keep it lively. Dr. Okay. I'm afraid we, we couldn't hear that slide. Uh, could you maybe adjust your audio uh, such that the video comes through? I'm guessing when we switched the microphones, that might have. Uh, oh, yeah, that something. probably threw it. Oh, you oh, missed all. my bad pun. Oh, my <laughs> word. This is, this is terrible. Okay. I, I, I knew if I did something. Okay, so where? See, um, try this again. Yep, that's exactly what happened. Oh, you guys are so patient with me and I was, oh, okay. So let's just do our, okay. We're gonna just show you our bad pun. Puns are great to start out a uh, boring videos because you can read them. You don't need to be funny. You don't need to figure it all out yourself. You can just sort of transfer something and kind of start with a little bit of a humorous note. So here we go. Hopefully you can hear this. To discrete probability distributions, we're about to go for the last group. And I think we should start out with today's bad pun. A guy entered 10 puns into a contest when he went to check to see. Oh, no, no. Contest. 
when he went to check to see if any of the puns won, he found out no pun intended. Ha! Okay, so here we... That's my, my horrible, um, you know, pun stuff there. But just try to find ways to interject a little bit of humor. And there's little funny pictures you can put on occasionally. Um, just anything, they often talk about the importance of active learning. And active learning, I could give you some really, I could give you several hours of discussion of the importance of having students actively engaging with the material. But you know, when you give a little bit of a humorous break, it gives some of that same, um, that same kind of help that simply uh, working actively with the material can make. It, it's actually, it is a help in students learning to have a little bit of humor. It, it helps them take a bit of a, uh, an intellectual break, helps their hippocampus to offload information and so forth. So it's, um, it's a, a little bit of humor here and there is invaluable. And what I like about asynchronous learning is I don't have to be funny. I can go ask my husband, okay, tell me a joke. Tell me something funny here. Or I ask some of my friends and they can, so I don't, I don't have to like come up with it extemporaneously. I can think about it and you can, there, it, it's, we got in our massive open online course, we had a, a 12 year old girl who wrote and said, oh, you know, I just loved your course. I did it with my mom. And I did better than she did because I paid attention to the course and I did not cram. Uh, I spaced out my learning. And then she said, I never understood that professors could be so witty. And I thought, of course we seem witty because we can scrub that witty in. If you have time to think about it, it, it's easier to just add something a little bit here and there that can be humorous. So um, I do want to, let's see how much time do we have. Uh, I wanted, oops, okay. Uh, oh, let's see, just hang on a sec. I'm, I'm going to pull something up. Okay, this is a syllabus. This syllabus, if it comes up, is, is embedded within the PowerPoint. So when you will see this, oh, come on. Okay, so when you, um, when you might get the PowerPoint, you just get to this little embedded document symbol. If you double click on it, because it's part of the PowerPoint, and not on my computer, this syllabus should come up and feel free to swipe anything that's within this syllabus. Um, but one thing I wanna point your attention to is a little trick that I use when I'm able to have classes and also have, so it's a flipped class where I, I have them come in sometimes and, but they're also learning online. What I'll do is I will have them take online quizzes and they'll have them take in-class quizzes. But if their online quizzes are way higher than their in-class quizzes, it's only the in-class quiz score average that counts. So what this does is it helps prevent them from saying, you know, I can get 40% of the course just with a really high grade by taking all these online quizzes and cheating um, potentially with compadres. So if you make sure that it's the ones where you are proctoring physically yourself that are, are that have the um, that count for the grade that can help you to you know get an, a more honest assessment of how well your students are actually doing but you need to uh, insert this of course in your your syllabus and uh, you can always take the syllabus and kind of um, uh, let's see I'm going to switch over to um, Let's see, we're gonna go up here. Okay, so uh, uh, another point that I think is really important we should bring up is that when you're teaching subjects, whatever you are teaching, 
you want to try to use metaphors wherever you can. So you'll see, you've seen in, in this talk, I use metaphors out the wazoo. Um, so which if you're, uh, if English is a second language, out the wazoo is an old fashioned expression meaning that uh, I use a lot of metaphors. So for example, the, the octopus, the sets of links and so forth. The more you can use these kinds of physical, tangible, seeable um, metaphors, the more it can help with students and their learning. And this is even in really difficult, advanced topics, for example, in science and, um, and mathematics and so forth. And the reason for that is because if you have a, a set of links that you've created already on one topic, let's say the flow of water, uh, that's actually a difficult topic to learn. That's why babies sit there and play with water and they're trying to figure water out. But once you've got that idea of water flow, you can use that to, uh, to more easily create a new set of links. So for example, water flow is analogous to the flow of electrical current. Now, every metaphor will always break down eventually. When it does, just throw it away, you get a new metaphor, but you can see, you can create sets of links about key ideas, uh, and that can help students a lot to learn more quickly. So, so when you're creating online uh, materials, you wanna really use this idea of creating visual metaphors wherever you come up, where, wherever you can. And coming up with metaphors, people often ask me, how do you do that? Uh, first of all, steal them. So if you hear somebody using a good metaphor, uh, you know, just start using it. That's what good teaching often involves is using good techniques devised by others. Uh, but you can also just go to the internet and search and find good metaphors that way. Ask yourself what a concept is like. You know, so for me, I'm trying to think of working memory. Ah, oh, it's like an octopus. Um, and ask your students to develop metaphors. You'd be surprised at the wonderful metaphors that they come up with. So uh, although this is, you know, it's not like this is a practical tool like what microphone to use, a metaphor is a powerful tool for online learning because you're trying to communicate all these ideas visually and, uh, and what better way to, more quick, to quickly do that than to you know, devise some metaphors. So um, with that, uh, I, I like to do a, um, uh, a quick breakout room. So if someone in your breakout room can come up with a, a metaphor that they would like to share that they found helpful in their teaching, I just want you to really grapple with this idea. Uh, and we're just going to, because I have so much left to cover, um, let's say I'm going to, we're going to do a three minute um, uh, breakout session. And so let me get you broken out. You've got three minutes and on your mark, get set, go. Does anyone have any questions here? Uh, we have a great question from Anya. Uh, Anya, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and unmute you if that's all right. Uh, please Hi. go ahead. Please don't reassign me, I like my group, but Dr. Oakley, what you showed is brilliant, right? We, I struggle all the time. Students want points for showing up, points for getting something done. How do you justify to them that you will take away their high score in the practice quiz uh, if they don't do as well on the real quiz? They're going to tell you, I get stressed. I can't perform under pressure. I should get my participation points from practice quiz. This is why. So what? Um, this is why it's so important to have it in the syllabus. And here's another trick that can be very helpful. At the very beginning of your course, you have a quiz that they must take 
to do anything else in the course. And there's usually a setting, and no matter what your system is, there's a setting that says can't go further unless you take this quiz. In this quiz, you put the question, I understand that I, you know, uh, that I will, that if I get a lower set of points, uh, that, uh, you know, that it will transfer to the in-class course or in-class um, uh, quiz grade. The problem is, so we've been talking about um, creating sets of links using your working memory. What students do is they, if they do not study or do not study well, when they sit down to take a test, their working memory is going crazy because they haven't created sets of links. So their, their working memory is just going nuts and they interpret that as I suffer from test anxiety instead of what it should be, which is I didn't study well because I've never been taught how to study well, you know, what good studying actually entails. So, um, so we unfortunately have spoiled our students by giving them an easy out that says, oh yeah, I suffer from test anxiety, when it really, I mean, test anxiety can be very real, but far more often, it's because students have not studied well. They haven't spaced out their learning. They haven't used retrieval practice. All of these are the good ways of studying. So uh, part of it just takes, you know, get, I think it's incumbent on us as professors to try to help students understand a little bit more about how their brain actually works when they're learning. Uh, and, you know, if you can communicate some of these ideas and what I will sometimes do, I mean, this is in my electrical circuits course, I will draw an image on the board and um, say to people that, um, you know, you're creating sets of links. And if you don't study well, if you don't practice, if you don't retrieve that information, you're not going to create those sets of links. And you're going to think that you just suffer from test anxiety when it's not true at all. So I try to kind of like build it in beforehand. So then when it actually comes to that point, I can say, remember when we had this discussion about you know, how to learn well? Um, and this gets right at the heart of good learning. And it's, uh, to me, it, it's, it's both a pity, but also a great opportunity. I mean, there are wonderful resources for professors about how to improve your teaching, but there's like, we, we leave the students kind of, it's a blank thing for them. It's like, oh yeah, but we don't, you don't have to learn more about how to learn well. We'll, we'll help the professors to teach better, but you're learning, uh, you know, that's all on you. Uh, you know, I think what we want to be doing is both, you know, professors doing, um, learning more about uh, how to teach well, but students, we can really help our students by teaching them more about how to, how to, um, you know, uh, how to learn better. Okay, so let's see, I think we're getting just about everybody back. Yeah, okay, there we go. Oh, this is so fun. Isn't it, is it, it's just, to me, it's marvelous because I feel like we can still, oh, there's Karen. Hello, Karen. Uh, uh, so we can actually communicate these ideas to a lot of people, but still have almost a personal connection with, you know, with who we're teaching, even when, it, when it's larger groups. And, uh, but it, it is, it's really fun when we get to, to talk and answer questions. So I better get going here because I want to leave a little bit of time at the end. So, um, okay, so I, I want to um, just talk about a little bit about um, doing stuff with green screen. Now, Camtasia, I talked about how I like Camtasia. It's about $160 for an individual, for a education person to get it, but you can often get your educational institution to uh, foot the bill for it. So that's, you know, that's one of my favorites. But you can do green screen stuff 
with Camtasia. And I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to show you, this is my basement, and I'm going to show you what green screen actually means. How do green screens work? Well, I just stand in front of it like this. Then we crop using a video editing program to get rid of the stuff on the edges. Then we stick whatever background we want behind me, just like the weather person at your local TV station. I can be in the jungle or in the city. We can even just stick in an animation from PowerPoint. Notice the infinite effect that we simulated by just draping the cloth gently forward. You might be surprised to learn that even top-notch MOOC making facilities that I've toured around the world often don't have a full-length green screen. Why might a full-length green screen be important? Because from an evolutionary perspective, things that suddenly loom closer to you were more likely to kill you. So motion that appears to jump closer, as when you go from full body to half body on video, activates all sorts of neural attentional layers. Motion of all types, especially unexpected motion, really attracts attention. So you can see there, I, I do want to take a little bit of an aside. So one thing, like, I like my hair in this video. I think it looks pretty good. But my pants, I look like I'm wearing those old horseback riding jodhpurs. You, you know, it, they're, they're so baggy. So if you find yourself in anything you're doing online, you're, you're kind of hypercritical. That is very normal. And just remember that, uh, everybody is hypercritical about themselves and, and you get used to it and you can just get so bored with it that after a while you're burned out on criticizing yourself. If you ever saw the first videos I did for learning how to learn, you would have thought I was staring down the barrel of a shotgun. I mean, I was terrified. And, you, and it showed and my little voice is all trembling and everything. And, um, and also you can tend to breathe in but not breathe out, and you can only do so much of that. And then after a while, you start talking like this because you don't have any vocal uh, range left. And, and so you, you just, uh, a little bit of practice does marvels, and you'll be amazed. Uh, even, it, you get over it pretty quickly. How um, so what are the elements of making great videos? Richard Meyer has done a lot through the years to, uh, to really put together this idea that words and pictures together, you know, can make their, make, help information make its way into working memory a lot easier than just either words or pictures. So when you are doing anything online, um, you want to always just make sure you're introducing complex material gradually. That guy didn't do it at the beginning in that first video. It was just like, boom. And so often I'll see this, it's people will get some big image and they won't take the time to cut it into the parts and build it gradually. But that makes a big difference for, uh, for students learning. And also don't just stand there like a stick. I mean, if, especially if you use Camtasia's green screen, you can actually to be pointing to things and, and interacting as I was in that video. Um, so get rid of extraneous on, on screen material. This is so easy to do if you have a green screen. Um, make sure that you have little stopping points to have, let people go off and kind of think about or engage with what you're learning. And you know, be really excited. Be upbeat, be enthusiastic. I mean, I can get off sometimes and I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. But, I, you, but when you're on camera, you, you just, it, you owe it to your viewers, to your students to just be as enthusiastic as possible. And if you're capturing yourself on video, that's all the more so, you know, because it's like, you can go off and you can be tired and you can go to sleep, but your video life is enthusiastic whenever anyone is playing it. And that just makes it better for your students. Also make sure that you are, you know, you're gesturing in a realistic manner. 
Um, some people will stand with their arms to their sides and it's just, uh, you know, this people learn a lot through appropriate gesticulation. Actually, there's some very good evidence, for example, if you're wanting to learn uh, um, foreign language vocabulary words, let's say that you learn the word bowl. If you go like this, as you are sort of like tarelka is bowl in Russian, you go like this as you're thinking tarelka, tarelka. It helps you neurally encode that information better because you're gesticulating as you're speaking. And when I'm speaking and you're seeing me gesticulating, uh, it helps you to still neurally encode that information uh, better. Notice how I kind of was like you and I was pointing like this. If I did and help you, so I was like an inappropriate gesture, that has been shown by research to not help you learn as effective. So appropriate gestures are appropriate. Uh, instructor shifts eye gaze between audience and board. Uh, so it depends on how you're, you're communicating things, but try to look directly at the camera, not at the light, but at the camera. And there's actually, there's two different things. If your camera's really close, you may, uh, uh, like on some laptops, it's hard to see that the light and the camera are slightly in different locations, but try to look directly at the camera. If you need to put a little stuffed animal on top of the camera, and then it's like your little buddy, and it helps you to be friendlier and happier for the camera, if it works. Um, uh, try, you notice how I, I wrote things down? Try to write things down in your teaching. Don't just have this elegant PowerPoint that does everything like I'm doing here, because it's a little slicker and it works pretty well. Try to, when you're having students neurally encode key points, if they write it down, it will go into their little brains much better. So there are a few important points that Meyer misses. Um, and one of those relates to attention and how we pay attention to things. So uh, we have two sort of process, ways of processing information. One is top down, the other is bottom up. So top down is like, I am physically turning my attention to the screen. Bottom up would be, oh my gosh, I just heard an explosion. Like it would automatically, if I did hear an explosion, my attention would be drawn up to that without me even wanting it. So the, what you want to do in your online learning is try to build in more bottom up processing, little subtle attention to movement uh, and so forth can help draw students' attention back to the screen without them going, oh, I've got to pay attention to this super boring instructor. So this, uh, I call this sort of a predictability principle that if you have something that stays the same for a long time, people's eyes are going to start to wander. It's just natural. But if you have some kind of change occurring, that can help. And it's funny, I'll stand in front of audiences sometimes and I'll do, I'll advance one slide, change the slide, and you can see everybody's eyes are like, they go from me to the slide. Everybody is, they can't help it. It's, it's movement, it, it, it drew their attention. Have you ever noticed that when you are, you might point to a bird in a tree, but until that bird moves, no matter how obvious it is, it can be very difficult for someone to see. But as soon as it moves, that people can see it. So it's that motion is one way to attract attention. But everything doesn't need to be motion. I mean, it is a bit of an art, not an algorithm, at least not yet. So, um, so but here's a few things to give you ideas. You can film yourself full body. Uh, and you can have yourself on one side of the screen or on the other side of the screen, right? So a little bit of change there. You can cut up closer, one side of the screen or the other side of the screen. Don't forget if you are able to do looming motion. And we are not talking a bunch of money here. You get, you can, 
get a roll of you know green um, paper, super cheap, uh, you know, for a couple dollars, and you can actually put up a green screen using a shower curtain. And some people I know have, have done that very successfully. So you can you can set up a green screen very very inexpensively, and then you can what that does. You can film yourself full body so you can be explaining some of the insides of whatever you are explaining, but then you can pop forward and that you know gives that illusion of your um, you know that you're looming and it, it naturally attracts your attention and it's not because you're dangerous obviously, but it still tricks the mind's visual systems. So the more you can build in interaction with the medium, and you can do this when you're creating videos. It's much harder to do. There actually is a program called VidBlaster. Um, so VidBlaster, if, um, if you're putting that. Uh, and so if you're kind of a little more technically inclined, you can put a green screen be behind you, and you can actually integrate yourself into a green screen with uh, with Vid Blaster, it's kind of cool, but it's a little bit um, high techy, and sometimes I I'm a little nervous about the layers of technology, but that's something to experiment with. But anyway, if you're creating videos, you can point or duck or whatever. So if you look at some of my videos, you can see I'm not just standing there; I'm actually talking about things. And um, and it's it, it makes it livelier for students. Just be careful when you're video editing. You do a, a crummy perfunctory job. It, it you know it's not so good. But you do something that's really you know just take a little bit of care, and students will love you for it because they can watch it and really learn from it. So uh, humor, again, I cannot emphasize enough, just little drips and drabs of humor can make a big difference in how students like your online materials. Humor is what, it, you gotta have humor online, just a little bit here and there, because otherwise it can just get so horribly boring. Uh, the old days they used to say, oh, it's a seductive, distracting detail, but, my perspective is people may not learn better with humor, but they will sure enough like your course better if you do interject a little bit of humor than they would any other course that doesn't have that kind of humor. So I do have to, I, I've got to show a little bit of Terry, my co-instructor. He's just given a seven minute talk on serotonin and neurotransmitters uh, of various sorts. And then, this is what he does. So, uh, you know, I'm going to stop share just for a minute because I want to make sure because you cannot miss um, his, okay, we're good, uh, his sound. Okay, so here we go. This brings us to zombies. Zombies can't learn. It is also clear from their behavior that they have brain damage, especially in the front of their cortex, which is the part that makes plans so here's this fellow, he's literally a fellow. He's, in fact, he's one of only 12 living human beings who simultaneously are a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and National Academy of Medicine. And, uh, and he's just getting off his pedestal and just having a little fun. And, it, and students really like that. So you can be very, you know, uh, official and you can convey the uh, information that you need to convey but if you break it up with a little bit of humor, people will love you. Uh, should you teleprompt or not? Some people do great without a teleprompter. Most people would like to at least have a, uh, a little bit of like bullet points. So you remember the key ideas you're supposed to be speaking about. Um, I like teleprompters, especially if I'm tr really trying to make something perfect. Um, if you're teaching for um, 30 students or a couple hundred students, that's, you don't have to be perfect. If you're teaching for thousands and tens of thousands or more, you want to try and make sure that everything that's on there is pretty much exactly what you want it to be. 
So uh, I use a teleprompter for some things. You can see our teleprompters on wheels, but you can use just a regular, you know, like there's, you know, what if you can't afford a teleprompter? Well, you can just use uh, a, any kind of laptop, put it as close as you can to where the camera is, and you, you can kind of wing it pretty well that way. And there's also free teleprompting software that you can get. So um, my teleprompter, I am so awesomely proud of my teleprompter, I do have to say. Uh, it's 24 inches, so it's huge. So I can set it way back and I do not have to squint. So that's the advantage of having a big teleprompter. So it may be that your uh, institution might have something like that. If not, encourage them to get it. Just remember though that high production value, you know, like the super well produced video is not necessarily going to be the good video for learning. I, uh, I'm creating a, a massive open online course now with someone and you know it just floors me I mean you'll get all these product production experts and they're they're talking about all this stuff and and they're really expensive but it's just what you say what is what are the images that you're having I mean that's the key you don't need all these extra production you know, and so forth. I mean, they can add if you have really good folks, but it, it's you as a teacher. That's really the heart of it all. Um, sometimes if I am shooting a script, I'll have a shooting script, which is just simple, what do I say? Then I'll have a video editing script to remind me of what to, uh, what kind of visuals I want to bring in. So if you do go that route, that's, that's one thing to do. Um, and uh, the, the half script that I mentioned is basically just have major bullet points and um, like this. So there we go. And this, and this. So just have that, use that, and then you can speak from those kinds of ideas. As far as a workflow for creating a full course, the things to have in mind are how many hours do you want? If you're creating a, a full course that's, um, you know, is it 20 hours, to five hours, 10 hours? Whatever it is, kind of get that in mind. How much of it do you want to be video? Is there our live components? Create a set of key objectives you're trying to look, teach students in this course. Figure out what you want to be, you know, live, what you want to put off that other students or that students can access at any time. My recommendation is whatever is really difficult, try to make videos of it asynchronous so that students can access it and re-access it. And, and that can be very helpful for you. Create a lesson plan for every lesson. Uh, again, difficult materials, try to make videos for it. Um, you know, have a half script or like bullet points or something for all of your, your videos. Um, up, take time to obtain illustrations that are quality and not just you know stock images um, and create your quizzes and discussion forums and voila that's your course right there but it, it can take time but if you create a good course it makes your teaching so much easier for years to come so um if you are videotaping, some hints are try to speak relatively swiftly because, I mean, students can still speed up videos if they're on YouTube. But if you speak too slowly, they'll be just sitting there wishing they could speed you up because they're more used to uh, rapid delivery. Uh, avoid that nice pitch tone that can come when you get really nervous uh, because it makes you sound a little bit like a squirrel. Just be very careful, try to enunciate more clearly than you would in person. Uh, because a lot of times there are um, people who speak English as an additional language and it's really, it can be tough if you're just mumbling uh, with what you're saying. So if you're filming a whole course, I recommend starting by filming some of the later videos. Then when you get to that critical first set of videos, 
it, you're more used to the camera and you just seem like a more natural, easy instructor. And by the time the students get to your later videos, they'll be wrapped into a course. So it won't look, uh, you, you, it, it will work out well. Don't be afraid to look stupid. Um, you know, just be yourself if you, if you can. And I, I hate to say that because I remember people saying, just be yourself when I was first starting. And I thought, well, myself is a nervous wreck, so I can't do that. But you'll see that it, the more you're in front of the camera, the more it starts to seem very natural. Um, and as I mentioned, everybody's hypercritical of themselves, and that's the way it is. Uh, you just get used to it. Uh, fake it until you make it. So if you, like some of my videos, I, I had splitting migraine headaches and you would never know it. People are like, gosh, you look so happy. So what you're doing online is, um, I, I mean, you can just fake it so much easier than you can in a real life classroom. So um, often learners just don't know if you're nervous or, you know, anxious or anything. Uh, one thing to try to avoid, and I caught myself just earlier, so if you are watching this on a video, you can replay it and you can look at, at like two minutes ago, I was going like this, and which is, I'm telling you here not to do that. One thing we do end up as teachers doing is when we're really serious, we're really serious about something, we tend to have this furrowed brow, and what that furrowed brow does is it can also make you look like you're really mad. So if you can, when you're teaching online, try to avoid that very serious look. At, and it just kind of try to avoid looking as if you're mad. I, I do have to show my friend. Um, so this is Veronica Mueller. She's uh, doing the Spanish version of learning how to learn for, for children. People often ask me, unless they are Italian, what to do with their hands. And Veronica shows beautifully how naturally you can just kind of use natural hand gesture when you're, uh, when you're speaking. ¿Qué haces cuando no puedes resolver algo? Para los robots es muy fácil. Simplemente siguen estrellando sus cabezas contra el muro. Pero nuestros cerebros son mucho más complejos. Resulta ser que, si entiendes un poco sobre cómo funciona tu cerebro, puedes aprender más fácilmente y sentirte menos frustrado. See, look at how natural she is. It just, and she uses her hands beautifully. Um, I, I was giving a, uh, a lecture in uh, Naples, Italy, and I said, well, do you want me to talk about what to do with the hands? And they were like, no, skip that. You know, we're Italian. We know what to do with the hands. And they do. There's something cultural about, uh, I just, I love watching people in Italy because it, it's like they're natural teachers if they want to be, because their hand gestures are, are, are extraordinarily helpful in conveying meaning. So um, I, I would just recommend to you to please start watching television and YouTube with an eye towards what makes things work. Uh, there's Crash Course is really good, Michael Stevens, Vsauce, um, and so those are excellent sources for you. I, in closing, I do have to say there is one downside of online learning and doing it well, and that is the fan letters. So if, if that's your biggest problem, you know, it's, it's a wonderful challenge to have because if you do your job right in good online teaching, thousands and thousands and thousands of students will benefit from it, from it. So we're at the ground floor of a learning revolution. What are you waiting for? Thank you so very much. Thank you everyone for attending Dr. Oakley's session. Uh, as you can see from the chat thread, uh, you're gonna have a few more fan letters coming your way, Dr. Oakley. <laughs> Uh, I think everyone was so very appreciative of you taking the time, uh, bringing your energy into this forum. Uh, I'm probably moving a little bit too much now. I'm going to be very self-conscious of this uh, moving forward. <laughs> uh, thank you all. That This is the end of our session, unfortunately. I wish we could stay uh, much longer, have a longer discussion, but hopefully uh, the sessions ahead give us more time to reconnect. 
uh, I'll look forward to seeing you, all of you uh, in the sessions to come. Uh, thank you. <laughs>